Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual Grand Canyon Star Party. I'm Ranger Raider Lane, the National Park Service coordinator for the event. And for 31 years running, Grand Canyon has been celebrating our pristine night skies through the annual Grand Canyon Star Party. Now, ordinarily, we invite hundreds of astronomers and thousands upon thousands of visitors to the park for eight nights to enjoy some of the darkest night skies in the United States. Now, each evening is typically kicked off with a special guest speaker in our theater, followed by telescope viewing, constellation tours, night sky photography workshops, and much, much more. Next year's Grand Canyon Star Party is June 18th through the 25th, 2022. And uh, mark your calendars, and hopefully we'll be able to celebrate that on site next year. Uh, this year, we are bringing Grand Canyon Star Party into the virtual realm once again, and we're really excited. We have a whole host of incredible speakers and, and telescope viewing sessions uh, for you to enjoy. And before we introduce uh, our special guest speaker this evening, I just have a few entities I would like to thank from the National Park Service uh, for our uh, help in supporting this event. Uh, number one, I would like to thank Grand Canyon Conservancy. Now, they're the park's official nonprofit partner, and they do amazing work helping to preserve the dark skies in Grand Canyon and beyond. I'd like to thank the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, they're the uh, entity that certified Grand Canyon National Park as an international dark sky park back in June of 2019. Uh, thank you to the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. Uh, they're the entity that comes up and has been coming up for decades at this point to volunteer their time, share their telescopes and equipment and expertise um, to the visitors of Grand Canyon uh, for this annual event. So thank you so much to them. And finally, for the Society, uh, thank you to the Society for Cultural Astronomy in the American Southwest. Uh, they are uh, a group that has helped us to organize many of our uh, special guest speakers this year. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce tonight's special guest speaker. Uh, tonight, we are honored and excited to have with us Aaron Yazi. Uh, now, Aaron Yazi is a mechanical engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California where he designs mechanical systems for NASA's robotic space research missions with a focus on planetary sample acquisition and handling. His most extensive contributions are for missions to the planet Mars. Aaron was born in Tuba City, Arizona and was raised in Holbrook, Holbrook Arizona, right, right here in Grand Canyon region. Um, Aaron is a Sequoia Fellow and professional member of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society uh, in 2016, Yazi was honored by the Navajo Nation Council for, quote, serving as an inspiration to Diné youth and citizens. And in 2019, uh, Aaron Yazi received the NASA JPL Bruce Murray Award uh, for outstanding and consistent dedication in promoting inclusion and excitement in science and education, especially among indigenous communities. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you. Oh, I'm so excited to be with you guys too. I mean, virtually, but it's really nice to hear from people back home. Absolutely, take it away. Okay, um, so I'm once again, I'm really excited and happy to be with you guys tonight. Um, I am going to be talking to you guys a lot about my recent mission, the past five years that I spent working on the Mars Science Laboratory or sorry, not the Mars Science Laboratory, the Mars 2020 Perseverance Rover. Um, uh, I'm gonna pull up some slides, there's a lot of them to get through, so hopefully we can get through them pretty quickly and have some time for a chat afterwards. Okay. Okay, um, first off, let me just reintroduce yourself, uh, myself in, in my own language. Yat eh, everybody, she'e, Aaron Yazi, and she'e, ashihe nishle, todachit ni bashish chin, Kiani de Shiche, Tokane de Chanelle, Kutagoe de Nishle, Alot Isiak and De Nasha, Shema, Doshe, Shirley Do Kiazi, will ye? Hi, everybody. My name's Aaron Yazi. Um, I'm of the Salt Clan, born for the Bitterwater Clan. Um, my mother's father's clan is the Towering House people, and my father's father's clan is the Near the Water people. Um, I was originally born in Tuba City, Arizona. 
um, right close to the Grand Canyon. Actually, my mom's side of the family uh, is is from Cameron area, Shadow Mountain, and there are uh, small parts of the canyon that reach all the way out into that area. Um, so I feel very at home there. Um, my father's side of the family is from Black Mesa Kienta area, which is up near Monument Valley. So I'm from uh, I have I have deep roots with my family um, back on the Navajo Nation, and I just uh, have been blessed by being surrounded by just beautiful natural wonders of the world like that. Um, and I think that now my job at NASA, working with stuff that are exploring Mars, it's just another uh, another extension of exploring beautiful rock formations and landforms and geology. Um, so, without further ado, let's start. So this is a picture uh, or a slide showing side-by-side -side images, one on the left of uh, Mars. This is the foothills of Gale Crater on Mars taken by the Curiosity Rover. Picture on the right was taken by my older brother of me standing on the Navajo Nation near Tuba City, Arizona. If you've ever driven between Flagstaff and say Page, um, just before, if, if you were going towards Tuba City, you would see these foothills off to the right. Um, the painted desert area, you can see the similarities between these two landforms. Um, the colors of the hills, um, the way they look like they were formed. There's also just the way that the pebbles are laying at the feet. Um, here's another great picture to compare. So on the left is a picture of me standing on a little cliff uh, near Lake Powell, Arizona. And then on the right is a picture of Vera Rubin Ridge taken on Mars by the Curiosity Rover. Once again, similar shapes of the cliffs, um, rock formations, the layers, the way that the colors of the layers show up. Here are two more pictures taken by the Curiosity Rover of Mars. You can see some mesas, some hills, some little sand dunes. And then here's a picture of uh, actually the area where my grandparents' house is near Shadow Mountain, Arizona, actually very close to the Grand Canyon. Um, and I really like to show all these pictures side by side to really bring home the fact that Mars and Earth are related planets. I like to call them cousins. They have the same origin story, they're related. The way that they developed over billions of years is the same. So here on Earth, the way rock formations and land formations like this might form is through billions of years of um, forces like uh, earthquakes, um, volcanoes, um, erosion caused by wind and weather, but also by water flowing over certain areas. Um, all of that stuff exists on Mars as well. So just like Earth has earthquakes, Mars has Mars quakes. Um, just, they have volcanoes. They have, uh, they have a little bit of wind, but they also had flowing water all over Mars. And that's what helped shaped the way that the deserts of Mars uh, look today, which is why they look so similar to a region like Northern Arizona. Um, so both of them are, are terrestrial planets. They're both rocky planets. And when we study Mars, we're actually trying to study the way that it developed over billions of years. And then more importantly now, the way that life might have developed on a planet like Mars over billions of years. And so we're learning a lot about a planet that is very similar to ours. We're learning a lot about our own history. Um, and so that's why I think it's important that we study Mars. And in the past, we've we certainly are infatuated with Mars. So we've sent a lot of missions there. Um, here's just a sort of a family picture of a lot of past missions and present missions that we've sent to Mars. The one at the bottom is uh, the little robot called Sojourner. It's about the size of a microwave on wheels. And it was really just the first robot we sent there to prove that we could drive anything on that planet. Um, Mars is kind of a harsh place for robots. It's very cold. Um, and, and, and very dusty that can get inside mechanisms. And so we wanted to prove that we could drive anything there and Sojourner proved that for us. And so once we did that, we wanted to go with more science uh, on a robot. And so we sent the Mars Exploration Rover. Um, we actually sent two of them. Those are the ones that we've named, or they're, they're known by the twin rovers and their names were Spirit and Opportunity. Um, those two rovers were sent to Mars to, to search for signs of life, or sorry, they were searched there to, to search for signs of water on the planet. Um, and they, they were able to successfully achieve that mission. They found that Mars once had lakes and it had rivers um, flowing all over it, um, which is really exciting because we know that if there's 
water on a pl on a rocky planet like like Mars that there's a possibility that life could have existed there and so that's what got scientists thinking that maybe we should send a bigger rover with its own laboratory inside of it so we sent the Mars Science Laboratory rover which is the big rover you see in the back um, it's about the size of a small SUV weighs about one ton um, it stands about seven feet tall um, and so in the body of that rover is an entire laboratory that is that is able and capable to study rocks. And the way that we study those rocks is by acquiring samples of them by drilling into the rocks with a giant drill on an arm. Um, it creates this powder that we then pass off into the science instruments. And it was looking to see any signs in within Mars's rocks in geology. Um, if there, uh, if all the conditions were right and appropriate for life to even exist on that planet because we know that water was there at some point but what about everything else you need for life to exist that's what curiosity was looking for and it achieved its mission it said yes it has everything that life needs to exist in as as we know it on a planet um and so what we really wanted to do was find out once and for all if Life, life existed there at some point. And so that's why we sent Mars 2020, the Perseverance rover. Um, Perseverance, you can see, it's the one on the far left. It, it looks exactly, it looks uh, very similar to the Mars Science Laboratory. And that's because we used a lot of the same designs. Um, the, the wheel uh, boat rocker bogey system, um, the mast, which is sort of like the rover's head, is very similar. A lot of the cameras are the same. The arm design is the same. Um, the body of the rover is the same and the batteries are the same. Um, what's different about it is that with the Mars 2020 rover, we wanted to drill into rocks, again, with a giant drill on the end of an arm. But we, instead of turning it into a powder and studying the powder on Mars, we wanted to extract a nice preserved core of rock from the rocks that we drill into save them inside sample tubes so that we can bring them back to earth and study them here on earth um, and look for signs of ancient life. Um, so that's the purpose of perseverance. And so that's the, the major um, uh, question that we're trying to answer with this rover, was there ever life on Mars? And so the reason why we think that this is possible, uh, that, that, that there was life there is that, um, here on Earth, we have examples of living what we call microbial life. Um, these are what we call stromatolites that existed really long time. It was the first forms of life that ever came to be on Earth, and they formed inside water. And so you can see a picture of that um, there on the left. Um, we've also found examples of that in, a, in its fossilized form. So that means scientists were able to see, oh, yes, these microbial life, uh, these stromatolites existed on Earth at the earliest point of its development. Um, and so they believe that if we can find the same thing on Mars, because Mars and Earth were on a similar uh, origin story, a similar track, um, there's a possibility we could find those fossils on Mars as well. Um, and so how do we do that? We drill into the rocks and we get cores. So similar to the ones you see in the bottom, the geologists here on Earth will extract rock cores from from all the rocks that they want to study and it nicely preserves all the layers and that's how we can study and and look for all of those ancient microbial life forms um, so that's what we wanted to do on mars so we're sending the perseverance rover to an area on mars called jezero crater which was a giant crater created by a giant impact very similar to meteor crater near flagstaff arizona um, and at one point they believed that this crater was filled in by water making a giant lake and this giant lake was probably about the size of Lake Tahoe. And um, at one end of it, you can see the area that is circled in green there. Um, if you look at the very uh, left edge of it, it looks like there's a tiny little maybe like canyon that might be a snaking into there. Um, we believe that was some kind of river or, or some waterway that was flowing into that big lake and that created a nice alluvial fan at the bottom of that lake. And so if we were to send our rover right there, we could study all of the rocks in that area, the geology in that area, and not only see what might have settled down at the bottom of this really old lake, but also all the sediments that were coming down from the foothills through from that river. And here's 
the way we're going to do it, the rover, the Perseverance rover. This big rover, like I said, has an arm with a big drill at the end of it. And the drill um, is uses a set of drill bits um, to drill into the rocks and get the three different types of samples that we want. So we're actually able to get three different, we're actually able to use the drill for three different types of sampling. Um, one of them is to grab a rock core. The rock core is, um, once we extract it, it's gonna be about half an inch in diameter and maybe two and a half inches long. And you can see that picture down in the bottom left. Um, in the middle is a type of bit that we use to get loose sand. And so if you, were to barrow this, this drill bit into say a sand dune or something, um, you can extract a, a, an amount of, of loose sand. And then on the right is what we call a rock abrasion. So this is another type of drill bit that we use to just really remove the, the top layer of a rock so that we can get a nice, uh, use the other science instruments on the, on the rover's arm to get really nice images of that um, unweathered protected layer of the rock. And so that brings us to what my actual part was on the mission. Um, I was the lead engineer for all of the rover's drill bits. Um, so here's a picture uh, in the top left of me and my team posing in front of the set of bits that are actually on Mars right now. Um, we just finished building them in our super clean room and we're all smiling ear to ear. Of course, you can't see it because we're covered head to toe in what we call a bunny suit. Um, and we have to wear these bunny suits, these crazy clean bunny suits because when we're studying Mars for signs of life, we have to be super cautious and careful about keeping them clean and making sure that there's no contamination on them. And humans are super dirty. We carry around with us a bunch of hair that falls out and our skin falls off and we carry, we have dirt on us and we have cat hair on us and all this stuff. So when we're working on these parts. We have to make sure that we're covered head to toe to make sure that we keep it super clean. But then for our parts, because they were touching these samples, these very important samples, we had to wear another layer of sterile garments, sterile uh, goggles and sterile gloves in order to even enter the room that holds these parts. So what you're seeing is just an incredibly clean room and incredibly clean humans in front of incredibly clean drill bits that are on Mars right now. Um, and so lined up all, uh, in the picture on the right is all of them lined up. The tall one on the left is that is, is what we call the regolith bit. That's the one that's going to grab that loose, loose rocky material or sand. Um, the six ones next to it are our coring bits. Um, and both the coring bits and the regolith bit are actually hollow on the inside. Um, and what actually goes inside them is a sample tube. So the pictured on the bottom left is a sample tube. Um, that, that piece fits right inside the back of our drill bits. And then when we actually use them to get the samples, the sample will actually go right inside of that sample tube so that we can pull that sample tube out at the end. And it's, it's nicely preserved right inside that sample tube. Um, and then going back to that top right picture, the far right, two drill bits, those little short ones are, are our braiding bits. Um, and then down in the bottom right, that picture is just showing the different types of rock cores that we hope to get. Um, we know that we're gonna encounter a bunch of different types of rocks and all of them are interesting to us. And so that was interesting because we, when we're designing these drill bits and designing this whole drilling system, um, we, we knew that we were gonna encounter a bunch of different types of rocks that might be really hard or they might be really soft or they might break apart easy. Um, and so we had to really um, design a system that could adapt to all kinds of things. And we're looking at things like mudstone and gypsum and tuft and sandstone and basalts, um, all that kind of stuff. So what we're hoping is that by the end of this whole mission, all of these, these uh, rock cores that you see in the bottom right, we would have examples of those back here on earth that we could study. And so in the meantime, after we've drilled those samples, we have to store them somewhere. And so there's an entire system that's living inside the body of the rover that we call the adaptive caching assembly. And it's this big system that um, it's like a factory of, of a bunch of tubes that we have stored and we can pick up a tube and we can put it into a drill bit to, to get our sample. Once the sample comes back, we pull that tube out with the sample inside of it and we can move it over to get a volume assessment to figure out how much sample we collected take some pictures of that sample, um, put a seal into it so that we can seal it up and protect it while we're storing it on Mars. And then we put it back into its storage location. Um, 
the idea right now is that we want to save all the samples on Mars for the time being. And there's a, a time in the future where we'll drop some of those samples um, into a cache on Mars, um, just basically leaving it into a safe place on the surface of Mars where a future mission will come and pick them up um, and bring them back to Earth. So in the meantime, while our team was off building the whole sample acquisition side, drill, the, the drilling system and the adaptive caching assembly, um, the rest of our team were building the rest of the rover. So the team building the mobility, the, the wheels and the body of the rover and the science instruments and the head and the cameras and the batteries, so much that went into building this rover. And so this picture is um, at the very tail end when all of these parts that were built by all these different teams was finally coming together and was being turned into this big rover. Um, so I think this picture is taken during one of its driving tests because you can see the little ramps at the bottom. After the, the, the rover was all built up, it's time to sort of package it up and get it ready for launch. And so they, this is the, an image of the entire cruise stage. Um, the rover um, fits first inside of what we call a descent stage. Um, the descent stage is the thing that will allow us to land safely on Mars. And then both of those stages are, are sandwiched in beside, or they're encapsulated inside of a heat shield. Um, and then that whole system is attached to what we call a cruise stage. And the cruise stage is what travels with it from its journey from Earth to Mars. So basically the entire time that it's flying through space and it has with it some solar panels and uh, ways to communicate with uh, back home um, and some stuff that we need for landing. Um, and so in the bottom left picture, you can see the rover is all stowed up and it's put, it's sort of uh, nicely installed inside of the top of the heat shield. And one thing I wanna point out is if you squint, um, what we're looking at is basically the, the belly of the rover. Um, there's a gold panel on that, on the belly of that rover. And there's something mounted there. That thing is a helicopter. We sent a helicopter to Mars, which is nuts. Um, we call it the, the name of this helicopter is called Ingenuity. Um, and, and this is another uh, demonstration mission. So we wanted to just prove that we could fly anything on Mars. Very similar to when I mentioned the Sojourner rover, that very small <laughs> microwave with wheels um, that was sent there to try to prove that we could just drive anything on Mars. Well, Ingenuity is going to Mars to just prove that we can fly anything on Mars. And, in, and Mars is a very hard place to fly anything. Um, it has a very thin atmosphere. Um, so what helicopters and aircraft use here on Earth in order to fly is to be able to push off of the air density and, and create some lift. But if, if, if Mars doesn't have that air density, then how do we generate the lift that we need to, to fly something? Um, so luckily there is some air there. It's a lot less than Earth, but um, there, the Ingenuity helicopter is trying to prove that we can, we can use that to fly. Um, it's really just going to uh, fly up and do a, a few flight paths and take some pictures. Um, there's not much else more planned for it, but if this, when we prove that this is, is successful, there might possibly be uh, more missions in the future that include flying robots. So the Perseverance uh, rover launched successfully in July uh, 30th of 2020 during the pandemic. Um, we couldn't, even though the pandemics had happened, we couldn't slow down, which was just kind of a crazy time for us. Um, the reason why we didn't really have any room to play with this because of our launch window. Um, Earth goes around the sun in a certain trajectory. Mars goes around the sun in its own trajectory, in its own orbit. And there's uh, Earth, as you know, takes one Earth year to go around the sun. Mars takes almost exactly two Earth years to go around the sun. And every two years, Mars and Earth get pretty close to each other in their orbits. And that's when we want to launch things between Mar Mars and Earth. Um, Otherwise, it'll take too much fuel, uh, take too much time. And so we really only have that small window of opportunity to launch things between the two planets. And we didn't want to miss our opportunity. So we kept to our schedule. We launched on time and we, and we traveled from Earth to Mars and landed successfully on February 18th of the uh, earlier this year. Um, if you've ever seen a, the video of the uh, landing of Perseverance, 
It is crazy. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go look it up. Um, I don't want to show it here because it's going to show up too choppy, but here's an overview of it. Um, basically, we're, we're entering Mars, uh, we're approaching Mars with our full crew stage. Um, we have to separate from that top crew stage because we don't need that anymore. Um, and then all, it's, all that's left is just the heat shield protecting it as it enters Mars's atmosphere. Once it starts to enter Mars's atmosphere, it starts to feel a lot of friction from those little particles in the air um, brushing past uh, because it, it was traveling so fast before, thousands of miles per hour, and then all of a sudden hitting some kind of resistance, it's going to feel a lot of heat as it enters the atmosphere. And so we needed that shield to protect it. So once we get slowed down a little bit and we're inside Mars's atmosphere, we can safely get rid of that front heat shield. So we get rid of that. Oh, sorry, first, first before we do that, we deploy a giant parachute. Um, this parachute is tricky. Like we, like I mentioned before, it's very hard to fly anything on Mars because it has low, it has a low air density. Same thing with parachutes. We can deploy a giant parachute, but it can only really slow us down so much. Um, so we deploy as big a parachute as we can to slow us down a whole lot. Um, once we're slowed down, we can get rid of that heat shield um, because we have slowed down. And at that point, the rover, which is tucked up inside the, the, the top portion of the heat shield, can finally see the, the surface of Mars. Um, once it can see the, the Martian surface, it starts to look around and starts to map what it sees and starts to figure out where it wants to land. Um, that, uh, that system is new for this, this, this mission. They call it terrain relative navigation. Sort of a, 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 it had the brains to determine for itself its own safest landing location, which is kind of insane. So um, once the, the parachute has slowed it down to a certain point, um, it can't slow us down all the way. So we kind of have to get rid of it and find another mode to slow us down the, the entire way. So we will then separate from that whole parachute and, and uh, back shell. And we free fall for a split second in Mars, Mars's air. And then we turn on our powered descent stage, which is basically like a jetpack. So the rover comes down on this jetpack um, and this is what slows it down the most as it's coming down um, through through the atmosphere. And at that point, um, it can it can sort of uh, make a diversion to to move us to the place that it determined was safest for it to land. Once it's uh, where it, once it's above where it wants to land, slowly moves to uh, towards the surface, and it's it sort of hovers about seventy feet above the surface. Um, we don't want to use that stage to go all the way down to touch the ground because of those rocket engines are just going to kick up way too much dirt, way too much rocks, and it might damage our rover. So instead, we hover at 70 feet and we lower our rover down on cables. We call this the sky crane. Um, and so it lowers the rover down until its wheels just touch the ground, the cables get cut, and that, that uh, sky crane can fly away. And then we have a rover safely sitting on the surface of Mars. So this entire sequence is all automated and it happens in seven minutes. And one of the scariest things about it is that because it happens so quickly, even if it were to tell us at the very beginning, hey, I'm about to start this descent uh, sequence and phone it back to us here on earth, we wouldn't get that signal until 10 minutes later. So, it's, it's a scary part of our mission because we're in the dark. We have no idea what's going on. All of this will happen and end before we get any communication from the rover. So that's why they, they, people like to call it the seven minutes of terror. Um, one of the coolest things about this mission is that we were able to, for the first time, include a bunch of cameras during this entire landing sequence. So we got real-time video of all of these things happening. Um, so in the top left, you can see the front uh, uh, heat shield um, getting deployed and falling to the surface of Mars. Um, the top right is a picture of the, the parachute getting deployed. The bottom left is the rover's first view of the Martian landscape and it, when it's starting to map out what it sees and determine where it wants to land. The, the middle bottom, um, the top one is the descent stage, or sorry, the, the sky crane operation. So the, you can see the jetpacks and then the, the cranes that lowered the rover down. And then the very bottom middle picture is showing the rover hanging from that sky crane until its wheels touch the ground. And the bo very bottom right image um, 
is us approaching the ground where you can see all of a sudden the surface come into focus. This is all really incredible. And you can see this image on the internet. You just have to look up um, Perseverance Entry, Descent and Landing. So then once we landed, we took our first picture. That's at the top, uh, in the top picture. Um, it's a little grainy because this is when the, the landing covers were still on the cameras um, that protects it from all the dust that might get kicked up. And then we deploy those covers, which are clear, and then we can get a, a better picture. So these were the first images sent down from Perseverance. Um, and then once we landed, we wanted to just check out the area that we landed in Jezero Crater. And so we did that by deploying our mast, the head of the rover, which has a set of cameras on it. And then we just used that to take a whole bunch of pictures around us, not only to inspect the landscape and the area that we landed, but also to check our own rover to see if there was, we could see any damage. And then we did more checkouts. The top picture is our first drive. Um, the bottom left is the first time we wiggled our wheels. Uh, the bottom right is the first time we moved our turret and moved our arm to make sure all of that was functioning. Um, two pictures that I was really excited to get down is the one on the on the left showing the launch bit, which I is a part that I built um, inside of the the core, uh, coring drill. And then um, the, the right picture is showing the, the bit carousel. So all the bits live inside what we call a bit carousel. Um, that bit carousel basically spins around and we can pull a bit out of there, use it, put it back in the bit carousel, spin it around, grab another one. Um, and so all of the bits are inside of that assembly. And that was the first time I got to see it safely on Mars. So that was really exciting. Um, this was a really cool uh, image for us to get to. This is the first selfie that Perseverance sent down. So the Perseverance, actually Curiosity, its predecessor, um, is really good at selfies, and Perseverance is also going to be really good at selfies. The way that they take them is that it had the rover on the end of its arm um, has a camera, which is called Watson, and it's able to just, we just take a bunch of pictures um, all around, uh, not only of itself, but the area that it landed, and then we stitch them all together to create images like this. And so it took this selfie just after it deployed the Mars helicopter on the ground and drove away, um, getting ready for the first Mars helicopter flight. And so that Mars helicopter, this is an, uh, how it deployed on the ground. Really cool. And then getting ready for its first flight and the bottom uh, image, you can barely see it, but there's a little tiny speck in the middle. Uh, this is the Perseverance's view of uh, uh, the Ingenuity helicopter's first flight on Mars. So this was really exciting. The first time that we've ever flown anything on another planet. And then we did another flight and this one's really exciting because this is an image taken by the helicopter mid-air. You can see it's little, the, the maybe little feet on the very edges out uh, left and right of the image. And then if you look in the very top left uh, part of this image, there's something sitting there. That is the Perseverance rover. It's just amazing to see what the first picture I showed you was one robot taking a picture of another robot flying on Mars. And then this is one robot flying and midair takes a picture of another robot driving on Mars. So this is just really exciting, really cool to see. Um, and then here's another um, sort of real time video that the helicopter took as it flew. So that's so exciting to date, I believe the, the Ingenuity helicopter has achieved its mission. It's taken five flights, I believe, and it's still scheduled to do some more flights. So that's really exciting. Um, I like to include these images here. Um, they're just nonsense images that the, the rover takes every day to inspect certain things it's going to do around it and stuff. Um, and they post all of these kinds of pictures on our website in the raw images section. So if you ever want to know what the rover's doing today, go to the raw images and it, all the recent pictures will show up there. And then one last thing I want to talk about with this mission um, is something that I'm really excited about, um, the naming of science targets on Mars. So the science team decided um, that they were going to come up with a method for, um, for sort of unofficially naming things that they come across that are interesting on Mars. And so the way they decided to, to come up with the uh, method for naming things is that they took the entire map of where we were expected to land in Jezero Crater. And they split it up into a bunch of little squares that were about one mile by one mile. Um, and then they named each of these squares after different national parks in the world. 
And there's probably <laughs> one square here that's named after Grand Canyon. Um, and what they decided is that whatever square that they were in at the moment, they would use that as a theme for naming different science targets that they came across. Um, and so if you zoom into this square, uh, the, the, the place, the square that we just happened to land Perseverance in is named after Canyon de Chelly National Monument. Canyon de Chelly, as you know, is another canyon located in Arizona, right in the heart of the Navajo Nation. It's a very important place for us Navajo. It's a, not only got a lot of historical value to us, but it's got a lot of cultural value to us. Um, the science team, once they landed there, recognized that and they reached out to the Navajo Nation. They knew that I was on the team, that I was Navajo, so they reached out to me and together with myself, the science team and the Navajo Nation, we're able to work together to come up with different names using the Navajo language that we could assign to different science targets that we came across. Um, and so, here, as an example, here is a one of the nav cams on the uh, on Perseverance studied this particular rock, and they named this rock Diego, which is in the Navajo language means like diligent. Um, so that was a really exciting part of this mission that I got to be um, a part of, and I'm really proud of that. And so to bring it all around, I like to show this. This is something I've always shown people. Um, I worked on the Curiosity rover as well as the Perseverance rover on its sample acquisition system. And with that system, we, not only did we drill into rocks, but we scooped up sand. Um, and I just like to tell people that uh, my origins are like the way that I learned how to scoop up sand really is from my grandmother. And so this is a picture of her scooping up some sand in her cornfield, making um, an underground oven so that we can make some kneel down bread, which is like a corn bread that we cook inside its hus in an underground oven. Um, it's just a really cool um, thing for me to sort of compare where I've come from and where I am now. Um, and and it's, it's why I do everything I do. So. Um, those are all the slides I have. Um, thank you for listening. Wow, Aaron, thank you so much. That was uh, amazing talk and just a beautiful full circle ending. Um, choked me up a little bit. There's just, what a beautiful story that you have here. And uh, I have so many questions, but like, I'll keep it down to just a few if you don't mind. Um, First, really neat that you're, you're, you have this, you know, you're designing the drill bits for this machine to go on another planet. I mean, can you bring that down to earth for us? Like, how does one go about designing these drill bits? What are you thinking about? What precedence has been set? I mean, what, what all goes into that? Because that just seems like such a, an incredible task to, to do. Yeah, um, I, I, just like all of us building on knowledge of people that come before us and things that we do, the same with all of us engineers. Um, there have been a lot of missions to Mars already and lots of things like Curiosity had a drill on it already. And so our team, I like to consider myself part of the whole coring team because the drill bits were very much a part of that. You can't really design it alone. You have to see how it fits in with the entire system. Mm -hmm. And so as a team, we look at past uh, rover missions, past drilling missions to see what worked, what didn't work and sort of built off of that. Um, and then also here on earth, we do a lot of coring drilling, um, not mm. only for things like mining and all that kind of stuff, but also geologists use uh, coring drills to grab rock cores either out of ice or out of rocks. And so there's a lot of similar things, even all the way down to just masonry bits are like things that any, any like all of you if you were drilling into a, a cement block or a rock or something at your home would use something similar so there's a lot of similarities between drilling things on rock and and earth uh, like i said rocks on mars are not different from rocks on earth uh, the things that are different when that we have to think about when we're designing stuff is the environment, how cold it's going to be on Mars, the type of environment it's going to be. And so we have to worry about making sure that we, um, like if, if, if it's gonna get so cold on Mars that we can't use lubrication like we would here on mm. Earth because it would just all freeze up. So we have to come up with unique ways to work around that, unique materials, um, all of that kind of stuff. And then the, it did, the added challenge was that we had to keep them super clean. And so, our, we're, we're working with this big machine that's 
bunch of turning gears and um, and and involves a lot of people and humans to build and all that stuff. And then our parts, the drill bits, um, we had to coat them in very uh, special coating to make sure that we that, that helped keep them clean and we had to keep ourselves clean and test them clean and all that stuff. So that was all part of the challenge. Well, and and so what what did it feel like when you saw that first picture of your precious drill bits on the surface of another planet? I mean, describe what that was like for you. <laughs> it is surreal. It is <laughs> incredible to see the things that you once touched and held in your hands all the way from I held the base material that it was machined out of and I held it every single step of the way. And then it's the, like, even the day I remember when we, when I finally finished the parts and it was time for me to put it into the Rover, it was like saying goodbye to my children. Like I was so sad to see them go. And then to see them finally on Mars, it's like finally seeing them graduate from college or something, you know, so it was really incredible. And where were you when Perseverance landed on Mars? So when Perseverance landed, we were still in quarantine shutdown mode. Um, I was sitting right here <laughs> in, oh, yeah. uh, at home in Pasadena, California, watching. And that's how every, a, a lot of our team, we were all watching remotely. But we all got to be together on a big like WebEx type or a web conference thing and watch it together. That's incredible. And um, what, are some, what are some sites on Mars? This is kind of a... a, 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 a a, a, a nebulous question, but what are some sites on Mars that you might imagine being protected in the future as some sort of national park? Like if we were to start thinking way ahead in the future, you know, not a national park, of course, but maybe some sort of international or, or solar system park. What are some cool sites um, on Mars that are maybe uh, just amazing places that we might protect in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, Mars has, from what I understand, I wish I was a Mars scientist and could tell you more about oh, yeah. every intricate detail about things that are, uh, features that are there. Um, but there are, I believe there are canyons larger than Grand Canyon. There are mountains larger than Mount Everest. I think those are things that would just be incredible to see, at, like, uh, to preserve and see. And to be honest, Mars is a place that I want the entire planet to be a national park or, you know, like something wow. that's protected. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like, I don't know how, how differing people's feelings are. I, I don't really want to assume that we're going to just live there. I, I don't like the idea of colonizing it for the sake of just as, as a backup from, for earth. I believe that we should take care of earth first. It needs to be our only choice that we are going to live here forever because this is where our home. Mars is just there for scientific study, not for us to mine or you know live or anything like that. So I'm hoping that for its entire life that Mars is protected through and through. Oh, that's that's fantastic. And then last question for you is, uh, you know, what what uh, what advice would you give to some of the uh, youth in Grand Canyon region who might want to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, sure. I mean, I grew up just like them. I, I mean, I was a I was a good student and I was an ambitious student. I had big dreams for myself. But other than that, I didn't have a lot of examples of people either from my community or from my family that had gone to a place like NASA. And even if you would have asked me as a kid, like if I wanted to be a NASA engineer, I probably would have said no, or like, I didn't think that that was something that was even an option for me. Um, it didn't, it took a lot of small baby steps. I went to a lot of summer programs that were geared towards Native American high school students that helped me one realize that I was a smart student and then helped me realize I'm interested in engineering and I might be able to do that as a living. And then it helped me realize, oh, I might be able to apply to a place I ended up going to Stanford University, which is the first time anybody from my family or from Holbrook, I think, had gone to Stanford. And, and so I wouldn't have been able to get that confidence if I didn't go to a summer program. Um, and then I got internships that helped me realize, oh, I might be able to work at a place like NASA. So it was all these little things that helped me realize not only the opportunities, but also my own, my own capability. Um, and so I, I'm, when I, whenever I talk to, to youth from our region, I want to encourage them to just not, uh, not uh, eliminate those big dreams from, from 
um, from your aspirations. Don't remove yourself from them because they belong to you just as much as anybody else. Just because you're from a place that feels like it's a bubble, that feels like nobody that you know has gone on to do those types of things doesn't mean that you can't be the one to do it. Well, fantastic. I mean, that's a great way to end it. Um, we're just immensely uh, excited that and honored to have had you. And uh, I'm sure this whole region is just very proud uh, that you're representing uh, us and, 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 and then representing the Navajo Nation in such, such an amazing, inspiring way. And uh, again, your, your story is just a beautiful full circle. And as somebody who, who lives here now um, at Grand Canyon region, I mean, just the, the, those pictures that you put up uh, side by side of <laughs> the surface of Mars and, <laughs> and uh, places on, on the nomination. It's just, uh, it's, it's so incredible. It's just a, it's an, an amazing story. So thank you so much um, for, for taking the time and uh, for everybody watching, uh, please tune into the virtual telescope viewing session that is premiering right after this talk. And uh, again, the 2022 Grand Canyon Star Party is June 18th through the 25th. And hopefully we'll be able to celebrate that on site. And perhaps in, in a future star party, you will all be able to uh, come and speak with Aaron Yazi as we're definitely gonna keep him in mind and try to get him here, here on site in the future. So um, Aaron, thanks so much and uh, good luck with everything uh, uh, in Perseverance and beyond. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you.